So tonight we're going to talk about eight reasons why every Christian should know their spiritual gift. And also know their spiritual gift, but why should they use their spiritual gift? There was a, a story of a, of a young man. Some of you may have heard this story before, but all through his life, his grandfather had told him, when I pass away, I'm going to leave you some bonds. And those bonds are, are going to set you off financially well. So when the, when the boy finally graduated from high school, he went off to a prestige college. It was an Ivory University, paid his way through college with, with loans, did not touch the bonds the whole entire time he was in college. Left him in, in, in there, didn't touch him because he wanted to wait until he got out of college and was going to use those funds to kind of start his career, start his business, all of these things. So as he goes through this career, as he goes through this college career, the day he graduates, a couple of weeks later, he takes and he he finally goes and opens the safety deposit box. And inside that safety deposit box was not only the bonds, but also was a full ride, a full scholarship to a prestigious college. And sometimes we do that with our spiritual gifts. We kind of save our spiritual gifts to the end until we say, well, I'm going to wait till I get all these things in order, and then I'm going to set the spiritual gift to place. When in fact, sometimes that spiritual gift may be the very thing that is the catalyst, if you want to use that word, in moving us forward in the ministry and the direction and the career that God wants us to move in. So why is it that we should know our spiritual gifts? So we're going to move through eight spiritual gifts tonight, or not eight spiritual gifts, eight reasons tonight for why we should know our spiritual gifts. Now, I provided you a copy with the notes. Everything on the notes is the same on the screen. I've tried. I'm trying to do better every week in getting this the print bigger you that your eyes are not that great, um, so I'm trying and trying to get it bigger and bigger, so uh, you that have said get it bigger, I'm working on that. So we'll see if I pass the test tonight. So number one, knowing your spiritual gift helps you understand the will of God. So as we look at this, knowing your spiritual gift will help you understand the will of God. I guess Brady's going to take over for me tonight. Um, so what do you mean by that, Pastor? Knowing your spiritual gifts helps you understand the will of God. So as we look at our life, if you can kind of look and figure out your spiritual gift, and I, towards the end of the series or the middle of the series, I've not figured out what I want to do, it, but I want to pass out a spiritual gift test. Some of you may want to take that. Some of you have already taken those. But to kind of see what is the spiritual gift that God's given you. Some of you have never figured that out in your life. Some of you already know what your spiritual gift is, and you're kind of set. You're using that spiritual gift. God's blessed you in that way, and you know what that is. But some of you kind of struggle. You're still trying to figure out, where's my place in the church? Where's my place in the ministry? So in understanding your spiritual gift... It, un- it helps you understand the will of God. Spiritual gifts are tools given by God for doing the work of the ministry. So if we can look at spiritual gifts, and I always like to have some type of analogy in looking at spiritual gifts, they're the tools that God gives us to do the work. For example, if he calls us to, to, to reach people with the gospel in our, in our tool, for example, my spiritual gift is pastor, or my spiritual gift is is, is, is speaking for, you know, ministering a pastoral gift. My gift, my tool is my, is my mouth. Believe it or not, and I have that tool. I can use that tool. But I couldn't use a different tool. So you think of it this way. If you have a hammer and a saw, some people, you, some people, you can't use a saw to hammer a nail. It just doesn't work. Or, for example, you cannot use a hammer, well, some people do, to saw a board in half take it this way. Just a few weeks ago, I shared that uh, me and Pastor had put a new video camera up at the front door as you come in so that Esther or me and Pastor or whoever's here in the office can see who we're buzzing in. Right now, we can buzz people in. The only thing we do is hear their voice. Now, it's kind of easy. You can say, I'm so-and-so, and we really don't know who that is. You could say you're a nice person, but we don't know if you've got an axe. Everybody's carrying an axe into the church, but we don't know what you're carrying in, what you're, you know. So we put a camera up so that we can look and, and see what's happening. Also, it, it alar- alarms the pastor between the hours of midnight and 8 in the morning. If the door opens, we get a beep on our phones that says somebody's entered the church, and, and we can turn on the camera and know who's in the church. And if, if it's somebody we need to call the police on, and we can report. One of those safety features. Now, there's a hole already in the wall, but 
the hole was not big enough for the plug. So I had some tools. I just did not bring my drill. I said, well, Pastor, we can, we'll, we'll get this and we'll chisel it out. So we work with a screwdriver and we try to chisel it out. So Pastor, and this is his idea. I'm just going to blame it all on him. He's not here to defend himself. So that's what you get. So Pastor says, you know what? I think if we take the drill bit, put it in the hole, and take the hammer, we can hit the drill bit through the hole. Now, some of you already know how this story ends. We get the drill bit into the wall, and now the drill bit's stuck. He said, well, let's get another drill bit and go the other direction. Now we have two drill bits stuck in the wall. He's, we don't want to leave it that way because we know if we leave it that way, come Sunday morning, there's going to be a line of people at my up to me saying, Pastor DJ, do you know there's drill bits in the wall? Yes. And there's going to be people telling Pastor the same thing. So our, our next step is I said, oh, I've got this huge piece of metal in my office from an event. I don't know. You, I get the weirdest things stuck in my office after events. If they don't know where it goes, it goes in, it either goes to Pastor's office or my office. And this is how the cycle goes in the church. It goes to Pastor's office, and he doesn't want it, so he puts it in my office. And then if you don't know where it goes after that, it goes to pastor. It goes to Dustin's office. So Dustin catches everything out of my pastor's office. It's just a chain of command. So eventually, if you bring on somebody on the staff that's younger than Dustin and has less experience, Dustin can pass all the junk to their office. But right now, Dustin gets everything. So we get this big piece of metal. This is big. Um, looks like a hook. I said, okay, now how are we going to do this? So I've got, he's got the piece of metal, and I have the hammer. And you've got a, you've got a picture of me and Pastor in the hallway doing this together. Okay, we're, we're dressed not in, not in work clothes. We're dressed in our everyday office clothes. We're not dressed to work, so we're on the ladder. He's, I've got the hammer. I'm hitting this piece of metal. And finally, we get the piece of metal stuck in the wall, wedged up at an angle. Why? Because we used the wrong tool. And it didn't work. Spiritual gifts are the same way. We can keep trying to put somebody in the same place, but if they're not called to that place, it's not going to work. They're going to get stuck in ministry. So it's kind of that hammer saw analogy, and you can you can figure, talk to the pastor about how funny that experience was. And uh, I said, you know, I'm really glad the camera's not working now, so we have this on video. Um, but it's it's truly the reason me and pastors should not be left to deal with tasks in the church because you never know what we're going to do when you come back on Sunday mornings if we're left to work on it. So knowing your spiritual gifts, number three, is knowing your spiritual gifts will help you know where to serve and how to serve in the local church. So not only knowing where to serve. So what ministry am I going to serve? Am I going to serve in children's ministry? Am I going to serve in youth ministry? Am I going to serve in the hospitality ministry? The fit team? Let me not use hospitality. Let me go ahead and say the names. Am I going to serve in the fit team? And as the fit team grows, you'll see the different sections of the fit team begin to come on. Right now, we just have that, that greeter ministry part of it and that, that follow-up ministry. But there's other part of that ministry that will just be a, a dynamic arm in the in next Tuesday. It will be kind of that outreach arm as we go to hand out food baskets at the elementary school. So, where to serve? So where am I going to serve? So we have to figure out where am I going to serve and then how do I serve? Because you may be called to children's ministry but it may not be to be the person that gets up and talks to the children. Not everybody's called to talk to them. Maybe your, your job is just to be there to care for the children. To be that person that stands at the door on Sunday mornings of, at the nursery or at the children's ministry and, and just greets those children and welcomes them to church and says, it's good to have you, what's your name, and, and gets to know those kids. There was a guy by the name of Patrick and, and Malia, or not Patrick Malia, oh man, um, Mullinex, wrong, wrong Patrick, Patrick Mullinex. So this is goofy guy, Marty Fife. Funny thing is, he, he actually became a cop. But Barney, <laughs> this is nerdy, skinny guy from Oklahoma. Not any meat on his bone. He has these big glasses and, and just this goofy guy. Nobody you would have ever chosen for to, to serve in youth ministry. If you he would have come to me and said, "I want to be in your youth ministry," I'd have said, "There's there's no way. You're called to go to youth ministry." But his gift was youth ministry. His gift was 
that of reaching young teenage girls and boys for the ministry. And he, I don't know how many kids he reached. His job was not to speak because he had a, a huge stuttering problem, but he could just love on kids. He, he had that gift, so he found where his gift was youth ministry and how was just loving on kids. So it becomes the where and the how. In some cases, in some cases it will help you choose your occupation. And here's where it becomes important. If we wait till we're on our deathbed to find our spiritual gift, we may live a miserable life. Because we may never be fulfilled in what God's called us to do. Because for some of us, and, and I can just use myself as an example, it defines what our occupation in life is going to be. For some of you, your gift is, you know, for some there's a gift of teaching. Their occupation should be teaching. Their occupation should be in that field. It allows you to set, and here's another one, it allows you to set priorities in your life. And I think this is when you have to begin to kind of weigh out in your own life is when you see your spiritual gift and you understand your spiritual gift, what are the priorities in your life? Because the things that you're doing in your life should line up with your spiritual gift. So if everything that you're doing doesn't allow you to use your spiritual gift, you're neglecting your spiritual gift. It's almost like buying a, a, a new car and always keeping it in the garage. Or buying that new tool and never using it. Why? Because you, you know what the spiritual gift is. You have the tool, but you just don't want to use it. You know, sometimes I'm, I'm one of these people. I'll get a new tool or I'll get a new fishing pole and... There, there's times that I really, I love it so much, I don't want to use it because I don't want to get it dirty. Because I'm just, I'm just that OCD and that much of a nerd. I just don't want to get it dirty. And then when I, you know, I've got a new, I got a new drill and I don't want to go out and then I drop the drill and I get a scratch on it, it just, it makes me mad. But sometimes in life we do the same thing. We take our spiritual gift and we really don't want to, we, we love our spiritual gift. We're, we're thankful for our spiritual gift. But if we keep it hidden, we're going to do all these things. So it has to set the priorities in our life also. And then the last one under number one is what God has called you to do, He has gifted you to do also. So God's not going to call you to do something He's not gifted you to do. Number two is knowing your spiritual gifts helps you know what God has called you not has not called you to do. So I'm going to say that. Knowing your spiritual gift helps you know what God has not has not called you to do. You cannot do a task that you are not comfortable in. For example, you cannot do something you're not comfortable in. Some of you, if I was to stick you, and we shared last week about the guy that I stuck in, in, in the three or four year old class, and he, he went out of that room yelling and screaming, and, and just I'm never going back in there. You're not, if you're not comfortable in a task, you're not going to stay in that task. And what's happened in the church, and and we're just going to be, this is Wednesday night, we can be honest with one another. What happens in the church a lot of times, and the reason we see so much burnout, the reason that we see so many of our volunteers getting out of the ministry, never coming back to the ministry, never coming back to the church, you say, well, that person used to do this, this, and this. Sometimes it's because we use them too much, but sometimes it's because we've stuck them in the wrong spot. Their gifting wasn't there, but we stuck them there because that was the only place that we needed somebody, or that was the only place we could find the fit in, or it was the only it was the only person that would volunteer and say, I do. You know, that was the only person that we could tag. And I'm not going to do that illustration of a hammer will not saw a board thing again. We've already talked enough about that tonight. Number three, I'm not gifted in singing, therefore I will will and should not be worship. I know. But I shadow a doubt that music is not my talent. You can watch me on Sunday morning. Maybe don't watch me on Sunday morning. It, the most uncomfortable place is during worship when Brother Johnny's singing a fast song is because I can't keep beats. You, I'm trying to clap, and I'm off probably like two or three beats. I don't even know how many beats I'm off. I'm thanking him on beat. I, I remember the associate Ocean Way one time, Brother Richard Hodges, he came up to me and said, you know you clap off beat? And I said, yeah. He said, let me teach you how to clap. I said, okay, teach me how to clap. So he said, okay, do this. And he said, it was like this, 
tap your foot, clap, tap. I couldn't do it. I was not coordinated enough. I was, it was like walking and chewing gum at the same time for me. It was not going to happen. Why? It's not my gifting. So, Brother Johnny never has to worry about me taking that job. You know, and, if I, and unless we really want to get rid of some church people and we want them to go home faster. You know, maybe that's what we should do, Sister Monica, is I'll start singing. And then maybe we can get Sister Eva to leave faster on Sundays. <laughs> Sorry, Sister Eva, I had to say that. So, we joke with Sister Eva about talking so long. So... You know, I know that's not my gift. Some of your giftings are not that. There's guys that think they can speak and they'll stand up during a preaching and it's just like, oh, you know that's not their gifting. So we, we put people in gifting, so we have to find our gifting. It's not your gifting. You shouldn't do it. You're going to be miserable in doing it. No, number three, knowing your spiritual gift relieves you from serving out of, and, and this is the word I want to look at, Serving out of duty. What do you mean by that? It may keep you busy, but you'll never be fulfilled. And and this is where we become guilty as a church as a whole, not just necessarily our church, but as a church. We we put people into things just to make them busy instead of really figuring out where we could use them. And if we really begin to find people's gifting, the church would function a lot better. Because we'll, God will put people in those plugs that we need. So, in, in this next section, we're going to talk a little bit about generations. And I know as we talk about these three generations here that I'm going to share, or four, not three, four generations tonight, some of the dates are a little dis, a little construed on what we consider Generation X and what we consider this. But this particular study kind of homes in on some particular characteristics of these age groups that I think is important as a church, as a body of believers, if we can understand this about one another, we can kind of see the, the the church as a whole and see how we bridge generational things. One of the things as a, as a very young uh, youth minister, my, my greatest struggle with the church was I, I hate seeing, and, and our church has done a good job of this, I hate seeing a church that's so departmentalized that nobody knows each other. So in other words, when we get on church on Sunday mornings, Children go to children's church, youth go to youth church, adults go to adult church, and, and suddenly we're one church, but yet we have all three of these ministries, and these ministries at no point ever do anything together. And you go to a staff meeting, and and honestly, and, and when we were on staff at a church that was like this, all four, the, all those ministries fought over the direction of the church. You know, when we were on staff as youth pastors, we would want to do this, and then this department would say, no, we, we, we've we done this this way, and this is our room, and this is our hallway, and we're not going to let you have this hallway. Why? Because we became so departmentalized. Because we had separated it so much by generations that we couldn't work together as generations. It would become a big struggle. And, and, and what happened at that particular church, me and this older gentleman that was the senior adult pastor at that church kind of took a took a took an oath together and we agreed that we were going to take these two ministries and we were going to make them work together somehow. So we took the youth ministry, we took the senior citizen ministry, and we're talking that church, when I say senior citizen ministry, it was senior citizens they're close to the grave. Okay, not mean, mean anything, they were just, they were very, very old. So there was a huge age gap. And we began to talk and figure out ideas, and we came up with this youth adoption program where each senior citizen in the church adopted one teen out of the youth group, and that became their mentor. And they sent them birthday cards, and we did all these things. And then every now, every other month or so, we would take the youth, and we would take them to a, a senior citizen meeting, church service, where they would do their music, and we would serve them, we would do events for them and it forged one of the greatest relationships between two ministries that we ever seen. And, and those two things, the kids would come up and they would pray for the older people, the older people would pray for these kids, but we were able to, to break a gap. And what happens is generations are often separated because we don't understand each other's ways or each other's thinking and, and we often look at it as a different of styles. Well, their styles different. It's not often a it's not different in styles, it's just a different approaches in 
how we do ministry and how we do that. So let's look at the generations tonight. Builder, number one is the builder generation, born before 1946. I'm not going to ask for a raise of hands uh, if you were in that group and here in this room tonight. But number one, those people have a strong commitment to church, their pastor, and the ministry. They owe all to the institution of their church and are willing to serve out of a sense, and here we go, out of a sense of duty, a grin and bear attitude, and they usually do whatever is asked of them. So let's think about, too, the church of that generation. Because oftentimes we talk about that church. That church, when we look at that generation of churches, that was a church that never, when it came to a work day, when it came to an event, they never had problems getting people to church to do those things. Why? Was it a bad thing? No, as a pastor point. But they were serving out of a duty. Not out of a sense of they were fulfilled or they enjoyed it, but they knew we have to do this. This is our duty to the church. This is our this is our life. So it was a sense of duty, not a sense of calling, not a sense of a really fulfillment, but it was a sense that they had to do this or they were going to let God down, they were going to let the church down, they were going to let everybody down. So it was out of a sense of duty. Number two is the... The baby boomer generation is 1946 to 1964. And this generation says they were committed to relationships or usually loyal to people, but not institutions. So this is where we begin to get into that, that group of church people that, and, and we'll, we understand these and it helps us understand the spiritual gifts, that they're loyal to people. So you'll see them shift from church to church. Why? Because they're not set on moving that church. They sometimes minister out of personal satisfaction rather than duty. So are they being satisfied in the ministry that they're serving? So you understand that if they don't understand their spiritual gift, here's where it becomes important. If they're serving in a ministry just because we asked them to serve, and it's not their spiritual gifting, they're not going to be satisfied. Why? Because that's not what God called them to do, and we only find it satisfaction in what we're called to do. It's not the tools. We're not going to have the tools to fulfill that calling. So they're not going to be satisfied in that ministry. So that's where that ministry comes in. And then we come in with the, the next generation, which is that buster, what they call in this particular study, in this book that I was reading, the buster generation. And these were the, the people born between 1965 and 1983. And this is the, the generation that I would fall into. And uh, They're committed to family. They want fulfillment in what they do. But they also like to have fun, fun in what they do. So they want fulfillment in it. But if they're going to do ministry, if they're going to have it, they want to have fun. So it's not going to be, we're just going to, oh, here, here's your, this is where we get into it. So when I'm giving these people their giftings, I can't just simply hand them an instruction book and tell them to go teach class. It doesn't work that way with this generation. I can't just simply say, okay, we're going to do this event. Here's your day. Here's your day. Your day. i got to show them that they can have fun in this ministry also. So understanding their giftings, i got to find and understand that if they're not having fun, which if they're miserable in their ministry because they're not gifted in that ministry, they're going to leave. So we start seeing that we have a whole generation, and this is where we've lost. This is where we start seeing the the great exit, if you want to call it, from the church. This is the generation where we begin to lose our grounding with the church. Why? Because we were not giving them their giftings. We were not finding their giftings, so they were not finding fulfillment. And we're not having fun in what they were doing. And then lastly is the, the Bridger generation. Watch my time. Hurry up here. Mormon Tree, 1984 and 2002, and we have some people in that generation here tonight too, committed to small groups and believe that the institution is meant, and listen to here, and I underline this in my notes, and you should underline this, because this is where we have to shift our mentality as a church. Shift our mentality. Committed to small groups and believe that the institution is meant to, listen to this, meant to serve who? Them. Where before all the other generations, we thought we were serving others. And suddenly we have this, this big paradigm shift in culture that says, no longer is the church here to serve others, it's here to serve you. So, yes, we've got to understand their spiritual gifts. 
So not only do we have to understand their spiritual gifts and find their fulfillment, but we've got to serve them also. So how do we serve somebody in finding their spiritual gifts? This is where we've got to help them find their spiritual gifts, and then we've also got to teach them their spiritual gifts. Where before, you kind of took that spiritual gift and you built it yourself. Now we've got to shift the paradigm and understand as a church, as we disciple this generation and this next generation and the generations that come, we've got to not only find their spiritual gifts, but we've got to teach them about their spiritual gifts. We've got to help them open that spiritual gift, polish that spiritual gift, and show them how to use that spiritual gift. So it has to be a uh, uh, shift the paradigm. Number two on the, under that one is they will serve, but they need to feel significant in what they do. So no longer can we just stick them in the back room and, and, and never say, oh, you know, you don't even know who you are. You know, it, it was, I'll use this as a, as a uh, uh, example. And this is being recorded, but we're not broadcasting live or anything. So we're on staff at Ocean Way for over two years. I'm not bad now from the church. We're on staff at that church for over two years as their interim children's pastor. And uh, it was just a, it was, we were going really to be children's ministries, but they needed somebody. So we saw the need. We kind of jumped in the need. And I, I love doing children's ministry, so it wasn't a bad thing. So we're doing children's ministry. So finally, they find a children's pastor. And we have a few months to step out of the ministry at children's ministries and just go back in the church and kind of sit in the pews where the regular people are. We've not been in there on a Sunday morning. We've not been in there on a Sunday, you know, have Sunday night. We've not been on a Wednesday night. They've seen me on stage just a few times for current events. They've seen me on videos because I've been on video announcements to grow my events. So they've seen my face, I thought. And so I get into the church, and suddenly they come up, and you would not believe the amount of people that come up to me and said, Oh, I'm so-and-so. It's nice to have you. How long have you been going to this church? been the children's pastor here for over two years. Matter of fact, your kid is in the children's ministry, I thought. So it, w- it was different. So it was that, that where was I headed with that? Oh. Show him in the back. Yeah, thank you. It didn't bother me, okay? But if we do that to this, this generation here, they don't feel significant. They feel un- very unwanted. They feel very unneeded. They, they don't feel like they're doing anything. And that basically the church is just using them. And what happens? They leave. So we've got to be very careful. Yes, we find their spiritual gifts. But at the same time, we've got to be careful to let them know they're still significant in the kingdom. And we've got to be very careful letting them know that, hey, you may be in the back, but we're still going to serve you. We're still going to feed you. Biblically, we're still going to give you those things to do. So they feel significant. And then the last thing under this is they like the most up-to-date tools also. They don't want and the, the outdated stuff. And here's where it becomes. They don't want us to hand them the old stuff that we use. They want the most up-to-date stuff. And that's where the shift has to go. So... What worked for us, you know, when we taught Sunday school, when you taught, some of you that taught Sunday school, taught children's church, and they gave you, and we still use this, there's nothing wrong with it, I, I still love them, because I think they're an effective tool, but remember the old felt boards. You don't get that to this generation. They look at you like, oh, what is that? Why? Because that's not the most update the tool. What they're wanting is more of a digital mindset. They want to use their giftings, but they have to use their giftings in how they've been taught. Now, is that the wrong way to go about things? Maybe. But we have to understand that so that we can help them use their giftings. So we have to understand generations to understand our giftings and so that we can work together. And we'll talk about it in just a minute. And, uh, uh, we may just get through four tonight. Um, It may keep you busy. So we're back to knowing your spiritual gifts leaves you from that sense of duty. It may keep you busy, but you'll never be fulfilled. Three out of four of these generations do not serve out of duty, but rather want fulfillment in life and in ministry. There is the important part. Your spiritual gift has to bring you fulfillment. Yes, it's there as a tool, but God wants you to be fulfilled in that. So you have to understand as you 
use that spiritual gift, you'll find fulfillment in life. Therefore, we cannot continue to recruit people just to fill a slot. Rather, we find their gifts and then develop or find a ministry in which they can fit in. And listen to that one part. Rather, we find their gifts and then we find a ministry or, here's the hard part, we develop a ministry that they fit in. There is a new shift in what we have to do. And I think as we learn and as we grow as a church, and I hope we grow as a church, as, no, I don't hope we grow. I know we'll grow. As we grow as a church, we're going to have to understand that there's going to be times that we're going to get some people that are out-of-the-box thinkers, and they're going to start some new crazy ministry that we've never thought of, but that's their gift. And we have to be willing to say, okay, we're going with this thing. You know, we're, we've got to be willing to say, hey, this was different. This is a different thought. This is a different plan. This is your gifting, and we develop that ministry out of that. So spiritual gifts often will develop ministry. And then um, one final thought on the builder generation. Uh, it is a common statement of many of this generation. I've done, and we're going to close with, I've done my part. It's time for the younger generation to take over. You never heard that statement. Nobody's going to be honest. I've done my part. It's time for somebody else to do these things, right? I know that I've, I'm not even that old. I'm not even in that generation. And I've said, you know what? I've done my part. It's time for somebody else to take over. Why? Why do we say that phrase? It's because a lot of times we've served out of duty and not out of our gift. Because when we were serving in our gifting, we don't ever want to give that up. Why? Because that's the thing we have fun. That's the thing that we most get excited about. You know, when I, when I get a chance to preach, that's the thing I get the most excited about doing. Yes, I, I love every, and I'll be honest, I do. I love every aspect of ministry, but my favorite part, I'll be honest, is preaching. And if I could do this 24-7, that would be the life. You know, but that's not what God's called me to do all the time. And I imagine if we get old after a while, I would want some problems. I would want some, some counseling sessions. I would want to do some of those things that are not always a must. So those are, we have to find our spiritual giftings for those things. So we're not going to finish these notes tonight. Um, there's no way. Because we're only on number four. It's 8.05. So, <laughs> and I don't want to keep you guys here at 9 o'clock. So, we're going to stop there. And uh, I don't think I've ever not finished the message. <laughs> that is the first time I've ever had to stop my notes and not finish a message. I'll just be honest with you. So, we're going to pray. And then next week we'll just continue this series and uh, pick up the notes from next week. If you can, bring your notes back. If not, I'll still have a copy here uh, for you. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we love you tonight, God. Thank you for your gifts. Lord, we ask that you would just teach us what our gifts are. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to take Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we love you tonight, God. Lord, you are an awesome God. We, we, we study Sunday morning, God, that you're a God of wonders, God. Lord, we stand in awe of what you can do in our lives, God, and you're still in the middle of the working business, God. We just, Lord, across this room tonight, there was need spoken, God. You know each and every heart. You know each and every need, God, and what's need, God. We just right now pray for this young man, God, that's contemplated suicide. You know his mind. You know the thoughts there, God. You know the oppression and the depression in his life, God. And we just pray that you would break every chain that bounds that man, God, and he would just see the, the love of Christ in his life, that he would see there was hope out there beyond what he's seeing right now, God. Just send the right people in his life. Lord, we just pray for God to Maddie this Sunday, or this Saturday, God, her and Brother Johnny, God, as they bring forth your word, God, as they lead this congregation, these people into the worship of your word, Lord. Let there just be a, a special anointing upon their lips, God. Let there just be a special anointing upon the people, even as they go now, God, that you prepare their hearts and their minds so they can be receptive and that you can begin to change them. Lord, we just pray, God, for those who are traveling next week with Thanksgiving holidays, Lord. Let there just be a special protection about those people, God. Lord, as Pastor and Sister Rhonda travel back, Lord, that you would protect and, and guide them. Lord, for the craft fair this weekend, God, we just pray that everything would go smoothly, God, that you would bring in people, God, and, and through this, God, that they would sit, there would be individuals that would see the light of Jesus, God, or that we would just begin to hear of salvations coming through this outreach, God, as we begin to reach out, God, and for the other needs, I know that 
I'm forgetting many tonight, God. Lord, we just continue to lift up Sister Carol, Lord, and her treatments, God, and this cancer, God. We know that you're going to heal, God, for Ramon, God. We just pray that you would continue to, to minister in his life, God, Lord, that you would show favor in his life and the things that he's facing, God, as he faces his court date, God. Lord, that you're just going to show favor upon his life, God, and that mercy is going to be shown in that situation, God, for Sister Eva, God, and her lungs. Lord, we just plead the blood of Jesus upon her, God, for healing. Lord, in restoration, God, that she would go out of this room, even as we speak tonight, God, feeling just a touch of your spirit, God, upon her life, God, and upon what's going on there, God. Lord, we're just going to give you praise and thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. 